Hello, I'm Josephine Burton and welcome back to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. And particularly welcome back to this series, exploring what happens to identity during moments of great change and trauma, with a focus on Europe, as at Dash we're in the thick of e-utopia, exploring what it means to be European and what we mean by Europe. It's very hard to talk about contemporary Europe without acknowledging the impact that the collapse of Yugoslavia has had across the continent. It's had a huge impact on me over the last 20 years, through the artists I've met and the shows I've made. We've devoted this podcast to the former Yugoslavia, the six or seven nations that it eventually split into, and the heartbreaking aftermath of its wars. And particularly how this splintering shaped artists who grew up in the thick of it and changed the artistic output of its nations. Over the course of the episode, I interview artists and historians who can speak to the great loss and pain of this fragmentation, as well as give us new perspectives on what Yugoslavia really meant to its artists. Milena Dragovic Sejic is a professor of cultural policy and management in Belgrade. He's written extensively on Yugoslavian arts, including works on borders and maps in contemporary Yugoslav art and theatre in the context of the Yugoslav wars. I met Milena about 20 years ago and still remember her incredible knowledge on the former republics within Yugoslavia and the complex individual politics at play. I jumped straight into asking her thoughts on how the loss of Yugoslavian identity affected the artistic output coming from its former nation. Do you feel when you look at the artists that um, that were practicing, who were making work across music and theatre and as well as visual art, do you feel that this shift in the national identities at the time did have an enormous impact on artistic work or was it was the same was the work already happening and was it just was there very little change? I would say that this shift uh, has a huge impact on artistic work in all possible sense, especially on artists that are from Bosnia, from Serbia, and partially from Croatia. The cultural space was Yugoslavia, and we truly identified as Yugoslavian. So when split came, and when all these national countries started to be created, a lot of artists made projects to show how it is destructive for their personal identity, that they have lost their countries. Maya Bajevic, for example, an uh, artist from Sarajevo, she made a very, how would say, interesting project, cutting the, the map of Yugoslavia in a dress that she is going to wear. And many, th- th- there was a huge exhibition in Belgrade House of Youth in 95, the room with the maps, because the, the artist became obsessed with the maps, with them um, uh, trying to, uh, to, to, to see what happened and how to, to which, what were the, now the new borders, how we can cross those new borders. Last year I spoke to Maya Milatovic Ovadia for our podcast on secondhand memory, where we focused on trauma cycling through generations. She was amazing and the podcast was fascinating. You can definitely dig it up through our archives. Our current focus on Yugoslavia gave me an opportunity to return to her. Maya is a theatre director, an academic and a lecturer at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London and has directed over 20 productions for the principal national theatres in the former Yugoslavia. She has a keen interest in theatre practice in post-war societies and a great understanding of her native Yugoslavia. I asked her for some of the context on the fundamentals that Yugoslavia was built on. If the identity of Yugoslavia was not drawn on linguistic terms or on um, ethnic terms, I would be really interested for you to just reflect, just from your own perspective, what would you have considered the national identity of Yugoslavia to have been in the 20th century, late 20th century, leading up to the 90s? Yeah, so so Yugoslavia was uh, first an idea. Uh, yeah, in 19th century, and then it was formed as a uh, as a country after the first uh, Second World War, and it was called Kingdom of uh, the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenians, and then in 1923, uh, I think, it became Kingdom of Yugoslavia. So it was based on on idea of unity of uh, South Slavs. Uh, so after the Second World War, it became a socialist federative republic of Yugoslavia that was uh, a kind of made of uh, six uh, 
republic. It was confederation, and it was made out of uh, six republics. So that was the kind of setup. So it was really multinational and uh, secular uh, country that uh, that uh, formed after the with this kind of uh, uh, self. Uh, uh, um, some upravni socijalizam, how, <laughs> what I said, I think, as, uh, how you say them, self-government socialism. It was a particular, um, a particular, well, way of, uh, uh, of socialism. Uh, and also what is important is that it was in between East and West, that it didn't, especially from 1948, it didn't belong to Eastern Bloc. Uh, so, so there was dispute with Stalin and Tito. So, so, um, Yugoslavia kind of, uh, became, um, uh, 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 moved away from the Eastern Bloc and uh, was a kind of positioned with the non-aligned movement. So Yugoslavia was one of the founders of non-alignment movement and it was positioned between East and West with what is also very important, liberal travel policies. So people of Yugoslavia would, uh, could travel uh, everywhere around the world. It was actually one of the really great passports to have <laughs> in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s. So, so that was uh, Yugoslavia. So, so like in schools, I remember that we would uh, write uh, like uh, essays uh, or we will alter Cyrillic and Latin in writing. Um, so, so we will, we could, we learn to read both and, uh, you know, all kind of uh, dialects were taught in schools. And uh, so, so in a way it was in that sense, really um, multicultural uh, country. Federation. It sounds so kind of extremely idealistic, doesn't it, um, as an idea? And now in our days with these fragmented societies, this, this kind of concept seems just extraordinary. And do, I mean, what's interesting, I've got sort of two questions. Is Do you think it was an answer? Was it socialism that gelled it together? And then as socialism formed, it was just impossible. There was nothing else that united the country other than that's politics. Or do, I mean, was it sustainable, that multicultural, multilingual, secular kind of commune that that's that that's the, the size of the country i mean was it could it have ever been sustainable or are we being entirely optimistic by thinking that identity could last <laughs> i think jury is out there <laughs> still uh i don't know personally i think uh it could be sustainable because uh how i see this uh, uh this whole thing Yugoslavia really existed. Uh, so when I say in harmony, I do not uh, think uh, in any uh, by any way that it wasn't without conflict and that it wasn't without questioning. So so I would say that that uh, the old uh, bits and pieces coexisted, and uh, as long as they could would be in dialogue, how to change, improve, and adjust, I think Yugoslavia would exist. Socialism did um, hold it together, but in a way that uh, socialism offered security. So if you speak to people uh, uh, who, who grew up, in, like my parents, and uh, you know, uh, we all remember, and even I, when I speak to my friends, uh, growing up in Yugoslavia in 70s and 80s was very secure, um, a kind of reality, like you knew that the schools were free, that uh, uh, so education was free and and, and uh, equal for everyone. Then uh, med, med, you know, medical uh, support as well as housing. So th there was this kind of um, notion that and a sense of community uh, uh, was was strong. Of course, there were uh, issues of how the country is ruled, and then. Um, late 70s, 80s, the economical issues uh, start uh, um, uh, uh, happening. But all those things could be resolved without war, uh, but we didn't choose that, uh, that option. So uh, I would say that it is based on ideology and ideas that multicultural state could exist. 
socialism was important part because it offered this kind of uh, social security uh, for for people. Uh, Yugoslavia was ready to go through transition uh, in. 80s, so after Tito's death and in 80s, but somehow this, and there were options like with Ante Markovic and uh, people were talking uh, through art and through politics and through uh, academic work about uh, how Yugoslavia can readjust and reshape uh, its uh, uh, political, how it works politically, but also kind of economy, uh, sh- sh- should it go more towards uh, liberal uh, uh, ways of uh, liberal market economies and how and, and stuff like that. But, uh, but then somehow in that conversation, the nationalistic options j- jumped in and overtook the, the conversation. And then uh, nationalism was uh, very seductive. And also it became uh, the only conversation that started happening. And inevitably it led, led it to the, to the break, uh, to, to war, not even break up like uh, Czechoslovakia that uh, uh, separated peacefully, but it, it led to uh, this nationalistic. And National populism actually led into the into the uh, into horrible wars that we had. Maya, thank you. That's so clear and so helpful to hear. Do do you um, does one see that reflected in art? I mean, can you see this uh, this sort of these utopian ideals continuing through the eighties and then increasing kind of more kind of nationalistic cultures emerging through the in the arts? Oh, that was that conversation taking place in the art? Yes, during eighties, the uh, somehow the the alternative culture started ha- happening and flourishing in Yugoslavia. So, so that culture was uh, questioning uh, this uh, kind of how to uh, uh, questioning uh, 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 socialism and also you know uh, taboos and and and. Uh, kind of what's uh, it was critical about uh, about society so so that was huge and very important exhibition uh, that that happened so so kind of uh, as only life can put together you had the same summer you have those two events that were coexisting and fighting and that's where the fight began do you go through multicultural art that's critical and that that is uh, contemporary and and kind of uh, alternative and looks uh, to to forward and change, or do you go with this uh, populistic nationalistic myth? So unfortunately, this other option won in Serbia in, in late eighties. You start having in the repertoires uh, of uh, Serbian theater a lot of. Uh, place with uh, national uh, themes so that were referring to again Kosovo myth as very important myth of, uh, of uh, cultural identity uh, or cultural memory and then plays about first and second world war that were kind of um, presenting myths as historical facts and that were placing the ground for, for these uh, narratives uh, of that, that will then kick in when the war kicked in, of uh, Serbs being um, always the victims uh, of their own goodness in a way, and they always sacrificed for the, the, this ungrateful, uh, ungrateful other. Also what is noticeable in, in, when the Yugoslavia started falling apart was that you had to, and Dubra Kostanovic, a, a great historian, uh, she analyzed that and talked about it in her, her books, how actually in order to uh, change the main narrative and main identity of uh, Yugoslavia, you had to uh, completely undermine Yugoslavia to to, to kind of uh, uh, question it and to, to present it as non dysfunctional uh, a prison. 
So, so quite often uh, it was used that Yugoslavia was uh, Tamnica Naroda, which is the prison of people. And uh, so now this nationalism is going to liberate people from that, uh, that prison. And that was done through culture and through education, because culture and education are kind of two main uh, 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 driving forces of creation of cultural identity, and then cultural identity very easily can be uh, uh, linked with national identity. Uh, education, but but also culture. So so you could follow like uh, um, theater repertoire. So one is this kind of historical place that would glorify this uh, um, this past and those myths of battles and and this kind of formation narratives. And then there was this alternative scene that would question that very very strongly and then when it came to people because a lot of artists grew up in Yugoslavia and, they, and, and Yugoslavia was a place where the culture you know the, the people would would uh, mix travel collaborate across the country there was this beautiful example of a theater called KPGT which means uh uh, kazalište, gledalište, uh, uh, pozorište, gledalište, teatr, which is word for theater in four, four words for theater, like kazalište is Croatian word for theater, gledalište is Slovenian word for theater, uh, pozorište is Serbian, and teatr is uh, Macedonian, but also universal. So, so that was really Yugoslav theater, and some great artists collaborated. So, so from uh, Dušan Jovanović, uh, Ljubi Šaristić, Rade Šerbeđija, Mira Pula, a lot of people from all over Yugoslavia collaborated together in that, that theater. Uh, so when the war and when this se separation started, a lot of artists actually continued to collaborate. Uh, first, because that was their natural kind of impulse, but also as a political act of uh, fighting this purification of culture. And that's something that continued to these days. So uh, because now uh, uh, art is also very purposely used to bring bridges. Maya expressed a sentiment close to the very identity of Dash Arts itself, an organisation that bridges divides. Our chat reminded me of my conversation with Christoph in our Borderlands episode in the last series. There's another plug. Maya suggested that artistic output during the wars didn't necessarily slow down, it just changed focus. I asked Milena for her thoughts on how work changed during the war years. I've got a question for you, which is which is sort of taking us a little bit further forward. What happened to the to artistic practice, and 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 can you could you can you see a major change? in the work that happened after the war? Absolutely. During the war, of course, in Sarajevo, it was a question of survival. And the artist was seeing their ethical responsibility to create arts and to offer to those survivors in Sarajevo at least some moments of reflective uh, and joint, you know, because in the war, you are in your apartments or you are in your cellars under the bombs and so on. But then when you come still under bombs in a theater, you feel that you are part of the group of the people who think, who fight and who wants something better in future. So the, the art was extremely important. Of course, you can't compare, for example, uh, three, four years of isolation of Sarajevo and same in Srebrenica, because in Sarajevo you had a critical mass of intellectuals and artists. That is the reason why it was so much more difficult in smaller cities, also under the siege. Srebrenica was all the time under the siege, but it was a rural population that was put in one, once upon a time, very small city. So what I wanted to say is, of course, art helped us in Belgrade also to feel human dignity. To, to see that among us there are people that are questioning our politicians, our decisions, our prejudices, stereotypes, and so on. I'm not saying that 
It doesn't mean that there was no other artists who were making what we call patriotic kitsch. There was a lot of patriotic kitsch. There was a, there is a lot of patriotic kitsch even today. In and I can give you that might be interesting uh, to hear. In Serbia, it's the kitsch of medievalization, if that can be said. In Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, it's a kitsch of antiquization because they went to the Alexander the Great and Philip II period. Serbia, we went in the period 12th to 14th century. The uh, Albanians, both in Albania and in Kosovo, they went even further up in history toward Illyrians, and now they are in the process of Illyrization, because the older you prove your existence on Balkan Peninsula, you claim more territorial rights, or you feel that you have more rights for territory. That's a, that's a great story, Milena. That's amazing. So you would say then, I mean, in 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 kind of in essentially what you're saying is the mainstream art scene in most of these countries, with the exception of Slovenia, is still quite patriotic and nationalist. I mean, the work that is being created is still about building an, a cultural identity for these independent countries. Official cultural and other public policies are in this kind of nationalistic euphoria. So not the mainstream art scene, because that's, that's something that is much more decent. That's the reason also why they went to Russia to bring artists to build this huge, unproportional monument to our first king from 12th century, Stefan Nemanja, in the public square in Belgrade. Because our most famous artists, they wouldn't accept such a kind of megalomaniac proposition. So they invite those curators, cultural operators, at least those that are not publicly uh, accusing government for misfortunes of cultural policy and so on. And I'm not saying that all of them are bad artists. No, in those is you might find a very good artist and so on, but those that know what are the limits of free speech. I love Milena's clarity that art helps us feel a sense of dignity and humanity, even in the darkest of times. She also provided a fascinating insight into the mindset of these fractured and emerging countries. Commissioning artists to build monumental statues to embed a retrospective history for your country shows a real national sense of deep insecurity. All the artists and thinkers that I spoke to for this podcast talked of these former republics delving back into their history pre-Yugoslavia to provide a sense of legitimacy and an identity. I wanted to understand what it felt like to grow up right in the middle of that fracture. How do you develop as an artist and create your own foundations whilst knowing the limits of free speech? Alma Fedovic Fajlik is a Bosnian singer and a music producer who was 12 at the time of the war. She attended Sarajevo Music Academy during the siege at risk to her own safety. Her entire career has been shaped by it. Alma and I were introduced by a great Bosnian mutual friend in London. I gave Alma a little context for the podcast before hearing her experience of living through the siege. We're going to devote an episode to the former Yugoslavia and to the splintering of it in the 90s. I would love to hear your thoughts on that as an idea generally, but perhaps you could reflect back through your family and obviously you have such a creatively rich family history. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You're absolutely right in terms of um, the circumstances uh, changing things. Although I was 12, all I could pick up at that time as a very young girl was basically that something was happening in a neighbour country, which was at the time Croatia. And we could see that the Vukovar is falling apart and many other places that, you know, there's a lot of bombings and, and tanks going around and a lot of people getting killed. But you know, I, could, I couldn't really understand what was happening. I mean, I could see it was, it was war and I could see the conflict, but I couldn't understand in details why everything happened. So at the time, you know, I was very much um, into music as a little girl. My, my mother was um, into music, my brother, and then I followed those steps as well. 
But I have to say, you know, in terms of when, when the war happened in 92 and when, when it all started in Bosnia, I wanted to be a pharmacist just because my aunt was. So at the time when, when we were under the siege, all I could do was play with things, play with dolls, uh, but play with with um, medicine, medications at the time, because that was what we were receiving as, as a medical help um, from abroad. But then, you know, throughout the t uh, 1992, um, as I was basically stuck in my flat with my family, I mean, still remember it, it's still so very vivid in my head. All I could, could do um, when I was uh, either b before going to sleep or when I would wake up in the morning, you know, was just to put on some music and, and I kept listening to music and um, on my radio. And I was waiting for the electricity c to come on because the radio was working on the batteries, obviously, at the time. It was shut out. There was no electricity. Uh, the water was not coming in. So everything suddenly overnight stopped. And, you you know, as a 12-year-old, you had to think about your life in terms of creativity and future. Like, what would you do to keep yourself occupied and busy because we wouldn't be able to go out? So I have to say the crucial point for me in terms of, of choosing a career and becoming an artist was... The war time was the time under the siege in Sarajevo. So um, I've decided to enroll at the Academy of Music in Sarajevo. And I remember as if it was yesterday that um, we couldn't really use any of the crossroads in, on, in the streets uh, in Sarajevo because they were all covered with snipers and it was very dangerous. And once I've even... Um, calculated like um, I was counting how many crossroads I have to get safely to uh, to my academy and it was it was 12 and uh, only seven minutes uh, the academy of music is away from my flat so you can imagine how many times I was risking my life to go and study and enjoy you know and develop myself to uh, to the music and um, it in, in a way it was kind of inspiring i mean this might sound really strange but the whole situation of, of of you know life still happening under the siege was somehow inspiring in a very weird way um in terms of artists in terms of artistical um life in in sarajevo some incredible things were happening and and some incredible artists have started working that are today very well known in the world and very recognized and established so um so it's something that I have to say I reflect on would um, obviously one side of my face is completely covered with horror and another side of my face would be covered with a little smile because I do remember some good things about it as well. And also, um, you know, it's something that is forever with me and it's something that has formed me as a person. And I don't think that I would ever have enough courage to be who I am today and to be doing what I'm doing today if I didn't go through this terrible, horrific experience. Alma, that's an extraordinary introduction. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for, for painting us such a vivid picture and such a um, powerful picture. Thank you. So what's interesting to me is 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 um, what kind of happened afterwards, because obviously that was just such an extraordinary time. And then the world sort of forgot about Sarajevo, right? The attention left. And, and there must have been, it, kind of, it must have felt like, I mean, I'm just second guessing, so I'd love to hear your thoughts, but it must have felt like a double failure, right? A double rejection because you've rejected, you lost an identity and out of the ashes of that identity became a new country, which was really struggling. Do you do you have memories? I mean, how was it? What what happened to you? Did you did you leave after the war, or did you stay? I mean, what are your reflections about what happened after that, after the um, siege was over? Um, well, I have to say, our identities were changing throughout the four years. I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say that we've changed once. You know, we've changed almost um, on, a, on a monthly basis because we kept waiting for a, a peace. We kept waiting to actually hear that something is going to happen, that the bombing is going to stop and that we can walk out freely. Uh, it was in, in, in 1996. Okay, so the war, 1995, sorry. So the war is coming to an end. And the day when we could hear the streets are like free to walk a river of people going down into the main street called Titova Street, which is the name of President Tito from the time of Yugoslavia. And it's it's still named Titova, Titova Street. I could see the rivers of people going and just like looking up, looking up the hills and looking up whether it's really true that we're not going to get um, shot. So I, I couldn't believe that those uh, 12 crossroads are find me free to walk by and that I'm not going to be I'm not going to be running anymore I'm just going to be walking like as, as every other normal person 
it felt like golden age in comparison to what's happening today. So I graduated in 1999 from the Academy of Music and um, and I didn't really know what to do afterwards. But I guess I was very tired because of the war and everything. So I really wanted to enjoy life. I wanted to feel free. I wanted to travel and explore and, you know, to find myself, basically. That reflection to you, maybe you were so young when it happened for you, but that reflection of that change between transitioning from being part of Yugoslavia um, into something that was Bosnian. Are you able to share any thoughts about what that did to your identity, that losing that, or maybe did to your family's identity? Um, well, I can recall a little. As I said, I was 12. I know that Sarajevo was the, was the main uh, pop rock scene within Yugoslavia. We had the greatest bands. Uh, some of them are still actually um, on stage. What I do remember that it was everything uh, from from the day when the war was decla- declared, like w- when we heard on the news, this is war, basically. Um, everything shut down. Like suddenly all those people were gone. As if, as if people have heard about, okay, tomorrow we're going to hear on the news, this is war, so let's get out of this place immediately immediately right now you know and i know this is not the case but i guess watching those images uh, as i said in the beginning uh, from what was happening in vukovar in, in and in other places in croatia were so frightening that that people were kind of expecting elder people were expecting uh, in bosnia as well so it's it's almost like it was all prepared so um, our artistical scene fell apart completely um and it was quiet it was quiet for a couple of months And then I do remember our national television, uh, Bosnian television, has gathered like some strongest musicians and uh, strongest strongest singers that we've had at the time. Um, I think Tifa was there, uh, Dino Madeline and a couple of other really big names. And they've created um, like a video which was dedicated to what was happening to us. And they've tried to sort of send out a message to the world that we need help, that something is happening that we cannot... We cannot, you know, do it ourselves. We need help. And then doing something like um, trying to send send out messages through postcards, through um, exhibitions when some documentaries were done as well. So arts was was dedicated to what was happening. Um, and also it was like our own cry out, you know, help us, basically. I remember one of those postcards, you know, Coca-Cola um, logo, basically. Um, so it's the same number of letters as Sarajevo. So that, that Coca-Cola image was taken and Sarajevo was written instead of Coca-Cola. And that was done by three artists. Uh, they call themselves Trio. Um, and they've created many, many postcards that went out in the world um, to send those messages of what was happening to us and also to, to ask for help. So we, we really were left alone. I have to say in the beginning, we, we didn't feel that anyone was 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 trying to help or anyone was doing anything or that anyone even cared. I'm realising as I listen to you that um, the war um, and the siege and the aggression from other con- neighbouring countries catalyzed an identity for Bosnia very fast. And I'm sort of not real- I'm only realising that now as you talk, I hadn't really understood properly. The creation of Bosnia after that, you know, from 92 or happened very fast too because you had to, you were being attacked. Yes, yes. We, we at the time all we wanted is independence, you know. And even even now, when I when I reflect on that, you know, when I uh, listen to that music of the kind kind of eighties and nineties um, in in Bosnia and you know within uh, the former Yugoslavia as well, you know, if you can pick up some artists, you can see the similarities. You know, you can see that that was once one country. You can really hear that within the music, within the production side of it. I've only discovered throughout the the, the war time when I was kind. Of close with friends and and going around and like when they were dividing us in in sort of oh are you a Catholic or are you Orthodox or are you Muslim or are you whatever you I mean that never happened before the war we've never talked about those things and suddenly it all mattered suddenly it was all on top of the list of everyone to talk about that you know Alma do you think the music um, culturally became less rich as a result of those divisions i mean do you see in the late 90s and early you know the last you know the early part of the 21st century has the music of bosnia changed yeah everything's changed a lot i have to say um i think we're not as developed as some other countries within the region are um like today i can't think of two female vocalists you know two female performers on the pop rocks 
on the pop rock stage of Bosnia. You know, we are, we have, as I said, we have a huge gap, and I'm not sure when we will create enough opportunities to fulfill that because um, nothing is changing. You know, within the last ten years, everything's the same or even more. Um, and what I, what I what I didn't say uh, when I've mentioned about the golden age um, after 2000, and I think maybe. 2004, maybe 2005, things went down the hill again. So um, somehow the money was disappearing out of the country, less, less opportunities to work, um, you know, not a lot of jobs again, you know. So something has again happened and things were going downhill. And it's still like that, you know. It's really, we're not really at the good case i think uh, uh, right now in bosnia and in any respect i have to say economically or in any any other respect and plus obviously the pandemic and recession and everything that was happening mm. can you can you tell us a little bit about your own practice as an artist because i i, I mean I, you're you're a wonderful musician and a wonderful performer and i i you know i've really enjoyed my little journey through the internet listening to your music and and you and and you have quite a diverse practice as an artist but and, and sometimes quite, you know, you, you speak out about kind of political things through your work. Are, are you able to tell us a little bit about it? Um, well, after I've uh, completed musical theatre course in London, um, I decided to stay. I didn't want to come back home. And um, on that journey that eventually was seven years journey or seven years um, life in, in London, um, I've had the most incredible variety of of different experiences and, 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 and different paths that, that I could sort of explore. And I think one of the main things that have happened was the, was the opportunity that I got to uh, work on the development of uh, the musical theatre piece, uh, the Lord of the Rings musical, composed by A. R. Rahman, double Oscar winner from India, and Finnish group Vatna. So I was called in, um, in a studio to do a demo for, um, for this score and to sing some of the music just because my vocal sound and uh, which, which was, I was told that after, after I've auditioned, was different. And the difference was my background, my story. Um, and I've and called it uh, the Balkan pain within a female voice. So they could hear that I'm carrying something, my background, something from home, and that I can strongly feel pain. That was something that I will certainly never, never forget. But within that um, experience, um, something that is very, very strongly connected to the war and something that I felt deeply that I have to do was a dedication through a musical document to the genocide that has happened in Srebrenica. The story was, was so deeply in me, like buried in me, but I had to somehow dig it out and turn it into a musical document that I felt strongly I needed to left behind one day. That was a short burst of Alma's beautiful Srebrenica, which will also play out our podcast later. Her professional fearlessness is totally inspiring and clearly rooted in those days during the siege. There's a great deal of pain, but Alma clearly has so much hope for her people and the reach of her music. Regals Halili, who I spoke with in the first episode of this identity series about Milos, is originally Albanian. His work focuses on the musical culture of the Balkans and explores how this culture has been forcibly shifted. He shared his thoughts on the effect music can have. There, there have been some changes, but, but, in the, but I would say the, the situation is still remains very tense. Music is always part of a, a political frenziness, a political uh, fight, especially the, in the last 20 or 30 years. And this has not changed from the time I, I was doing my work in, in Yugoslavia, in the former Yugoslavia, in Serbia, in Sanjak, in Kosovo, Montenegro, Albania. This has not changed. Culture, it's still a political matter. I, I believe culture is political because we very, very often we people who deal with culture, you, take a sort of a political stance as well. So what, is, what has not changed is the idea that, that our culture is better than their culture or our songs are better than their songs. So this idea of putting something that is uh, borderless into national borders, this has not changed in the Balkans. However, what has changed is the involvement of, uh, of the younger generations. Um, they do not want this way of thinking. They do not think this way. 
it's a clash between, I would say, uh, an older way of thinking, very nationalistic, very close-minded, and the new way, the way that, that I see among the youngsters who are in their 20s, early 20s, the war has, uh, has uh, ended 20 years ago. And the generation that has been brought up does not have the experience, direct experience of the war. Can you um, just tell me a little bit about the research that you did into the epic? Yes, yes, of course, no problem. Um, I was dealing with, uh, with oral epic poetry. Uh, I'm dealing still, I'm, I'm working on that all the time. Um, and uh, there is a group of uh, songs which are called variably in the in in, in Bosnian and Serbian they are called Krajistička. In Albanian they are called Kresnika. Uh, in English they were translated as uh, warrior songs. These songs are songs that tell stories about uh, fighting, basically about heroes that do fight with each other, but not on uh, on national basis. They fight about their uh, mountains. They fight about land. They, uh, it's, it's very much sort of a rivalry that has also uh, a, a strong element of nobility. Some say, some scholars say that the songs relate to the 16th century event. There was a group of fighters uh, that were fighting in, on, in the day border between Bosnia and uh, Austria uh, at that time, Habsburg Empire, the Muy and Halil Hrnica, the two brothers. However, there is a sort of a... a, a, a contradiction in terms because um, at that time the fighting was done via uh, guns because the the powder the the, the powder cake was already known and, and and people were not fighting with swords already whereas in the Albanian songs uh, especially in the Albanian songs there are no uh, there are no uh, guns at all they fight in the in in an old way with uh, with uh, duels with uh, swords with uh, with a sort of a very uh, noble and and somehow very much connected with the Homeric tradition that we know of uh, of the War of Troy, so it is an old way of fighting. Although ma- many scholars say that this is connected with the 16th century, and I do believe the songs are are older than that, uh, mm-hmm. but the but they were reformed once again. And remind me, because this is when the politics comes in. So these are universal cultural songs and stories, sung in different languages, but with the sort of similar origins. And then did the divisions show around who claimed those songs around the time of the collapse of Yugoslavia? Or were or were these tensions already there before that happened? No, there was no tension before that. Before the coming of the nation states, there was no discussion with whose is the songs. There was no division. There were no divisions between you know, a Christian song or a Muslim song. However, when the nation state came in and the national folkloristics uh, came in and the scholars that who, who, who were oriented very much uh, nationally in, in their way of understanding the culture came in. So then the, the situation changed. They started to appropriate the song and then the, the problem started. So um, what is... Precisely a, a connecting point, a, a bridge becomes a wall, thanks to these old nationalistic oriented discourses. It sounds like there is a there is now an understanding that this that this shared culture has the potential to unite as well as divide in 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 in, in with with younger generations. And is that actually? I mean, can you see that happening? In most of the cases, I see a sort of a division that is being uh, built. Uh, we we think we are trying to say a different story. There is a good sign uh, in the sense that, uh, for instance, both Albanians and Serbs have also a common history with each other. That it's not always a history of conflict. It's not always a history of, of killing each other. Quite the opposite. It's a history of neighbors that sometimes have fought with each other, but also have had a social life. It's the reality that that, that we're looking for and not the vision the political vision of enmity or eternal uh, friendship or eternal uh, enmity. 
both of these constructs are not useful. I asked Maya about the fragmentation of national identity that Rigal's talked about so poignantly through the recent politicization of these ancient oral drinking songs. Yugoslavian identity had to be undermined in order to fragment. That's just phenomenal. So that, but, but that must have been happening for, for quite a long time before, before the actual kind of physical fragmentation happened in the 90s. No. It must have been a slow journey towards it. You don't think so? No, it happened in, uh, in less than a decade. So it was really like a few years. So, so when you when you follow the repertoire and stuff, it was like mid eighties, and that's what um, what was interesting <laughs> uh, to to destruct destroy something. You you don't need a huge amount of that because there was just enough money and political will to undermine it. It just happened very fast. Yeah, it happened fast. So uh, and there was this kind of determination for that thing to 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 happen. When I'm thinking now about culture and and st- uh, very interesting that so after the second world war Yugoslavia built uh, over 300 cultural centers even in the smallest towns and villages so you still have them when you walk around but during the war uh, those cultural centers were used as uh, places for torture and execution which this uh, ideological element, uh, it, it wasn't only enough to kill people, you had really to kill their uh, identity, the cultural identities. That's why all these kind of um, uh, churches and mosques were uh, demolished. But also these cultural centers, which were very Yugoslav, because those were the places where uh, theater and concerts and exhibitions will come. It kind of pose the question of significance of culture, this need to destroy culture. Um, when I was uh, in Poland uh, in 2003, I, I was surrounded by some extraordinary artists, poets who had all lived in Sarajevo. I remember this unbelievable night where they were singing poet- singing songs and reading poetry together. And they were all cultural backgrounds and all, you know, all religions. And they, they embodied exactly what you described Yugoslavia to have embodied. They were in, still in such a state of crisis and denial about it. It was really extraordinary that they hadn't processed it. You know, for 10 years on, they were still scattered in exile around the world. And they said, you know, we don't really understand what happened. My neighbor was was Catholic. My my best friend was Jewish. I'm Muslim. I mean, you're like, it was this sort of unbelievable sense of, and, and then, I, you know, suddenly overnight, something changed. And that sort of sense to me of an inability to understand still 10 years on just makes me think what it must have done to people's creative processes to still, to have had received, not just experience, Experienced trauma from being having to relocate in some cases, but live through war. But that complete trauma of your identity being taken from you mm. so abruptly. I'm just interesting if you can reflect as a, as a former Yugoslavian yourself what that has done to people. There is this uh, artist in exile, and Sylvia Jastrovic. Uh, she's like uh, she's a professor at Warwick University, and uh, uh, Professor Klaich, uh, who, who sadly passed away. They wrote a lot about that the, uh, the Yugoslav artist in exile because huge artistic community um, is happening outside now of Yugoslavia. So this Yugoslav identity is still present in in artistic way, either for artists to explore it or to question it or deny it, it depends um, who you are. Um, and what what uh, what drives you but it is and also this kind of exiled artists yugoslav artists are also a uh, kind of uh, important uh, community uh, somewhere around around the world so going back to uh, what i truly believe that the this identity of being yugoslav is is still there it can't disappear because there is no the country doesn't exist anymore because it's not linked with this uh, politi- uh, how could, how could I say? with this official naming of the country it, it's kind of beyond that I don't know it's the spirit yes the spirit of, <laughs> of Yugoslavia lives on it's a really valid point that I hadn't fully absorbed of course that you know that it is the exiled former Yugoslavians that hold on to that identity most dear because they lost everything, right? They lost not just their passport, but they lost their homes and their everything. So, of course, it will live on more intensely for those people. And I'm sort of realizing, of course, it's now been nearly 30 years 
for some people who are growing, you know, who who, who remained in the country. Do you think people are making peace with the changes now? The artist, the artistic communities. I mean, I'm I'm asking a very general question to you as a specific artist. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily expecting you to tell me to know the definitive answer, but I'm wondering actually if to to live on in the territory of the former Yugoslavia, you know, it's a, it's a different experience now. People perhaps have made peace with the changes more. Uh, yes and no, I would say because of course the generations of women who do not have a living memory of uh, Yugoslavia, you know, they, they, they haven't experienced life in Yugoslavia. At the same time, it would, uh, because the the reality uh, is uh, not great, uh, even thirty years after the the war, of economy and and uh, um, politics and and everything down there is not great at all. Uh, so so all this kind of old narratives and and politicians economically none of those countries flourished so there is a bit of remembering of Yugoslavia through uh, sometimes uh, nostalgic lens and uh, uh, because the present is not not great but also I would say that Yugoslav identity became also a bit of a political statement that uh, meant that you are against nationalistic narrative. So now people are uh, having more conversations and, and are meeting more. So it is very clear that, that they are turning or that we are turning again towards each other uh, in a way because it's culturally it's a known, known space. It means that art and theater mean something if it completely un- uh, 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 the, the powerful, then you wouldn't have protests. So, so that positive side of the uh, of those events has the power to move and challenge and and question. Maya's reflection that the splintering and destruction of Yugoslavia, a multilingual, multi-ethnic collective of inclusivity and ideals, took less than a decade, was incredible. If you have enough money and political will, you have enough. And unfortunately, culture can be part of the warfare as well as its glue. Returning to Milena, is this notion of a Yugoslavian identity, is it still present? Is it, is it, is it now like a nostalgic um, vision? Or are, are there still artists who call themselves Yugoslavian? Um, I would say that this notion is still present. There are many artists from Slovenia to Macedonia that... Uh, insist on Yugoslavian cultural space. And uh, that's the reason why we don't like to be called Western Balkans, that we organized festivals which has very significant names, such as Festival in Užice, which is called uh, On the half of the road, you know, when we meet somewhere on the half of the road, because from Macedonia, from Slovenia, Užice would be somewhere in between. So there is significant number of manifestations that are uh, exclusively Yugoslavian, that might sometime include Albania for the sake of funding. And the new generations of artists, the young ones, they know new generation of Albanian artists. Things are more complex, but Yugo nostalgic feeling is definitely there. That's that's a brilliant that's a brilliant ending. And my final question, Milena, is what do you consider yourself? What's your identity? So uh, it's a very complex question, but I would say that I am a Serbian Yugoslavian, and that's uh, my overlapping identity plus. European, because that's something that you can see Eastern European also very much. So I have many identities. I googled Yugo nostalgia after Milena referenced the word. It's really a phenomena. And to some nationalists in various countries across the former republics, it's a perjurative term for a traitor. Certainly all my guests have a certain Yugo nostalgia. The arts have continued to play a role in sustaining it, in the music and the film and theatre and visual arts nourished by the artists of all generations. The spirit of Yugoslavia lives on. I'm hugely grateful to Alma, Milena, Maya and Rigels for their insights and their stories. It was a privilege to hear them and to be reminded of how culture can be used to undermine and destroy identities, as well as to bridge and heal them. We'll be back for our final podcast from the Identity Series in a fortnight, looking at European identity and Brexit. 
You can subscribe to our podcast via our website or wherever you get your podcasts to ensure that you don't miss them. And if you like the Dash Arts podcast, follow the show, share, and please leave us a review. It helps us stay visible and would mean the world to us. The Dash Arts podcast was produced by Rachel Head. I'm Josephine Burton, and we'll be back in a fortnight with more conversations. Thank you for listening. Yeah.